Well, hello everyone. It's uh, one o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, welcome to the Boost uh, Child and Youth Advocacy Center webinar series. Uh, my name is Rachel and I and my colleague Richard will be hosting the webinar today. Uh, before we begin our session, I have a few housekeeping points for you. Um, for participants listening in French, uh, at the bottom of your screen, click on floor. It's at the bottom left of the screen and select French. Si vous écoutez en français, uh, allez au bas de votre écran à la gauche, cliquez sur French, puis vous allez avoir la traduction. Uh, to see and follow along with the PowerPoint presentation in English, uh, click presentation at the top left of the screen. And to follow along with the presentation in French, uh, download the French version of the presentation by clicking on documents on the right. Uh, feel free to download the presentation in both English and French by clicking documents on the right. There will be a question and answer period during the last few minutes of the webinar, but last five minutes, we might have a bit more time. Um, to submit your question, please go to the toolbar on the right, click on messaging, and then click participants, and then type in your question in that field. So you can submit questions at any time, uh, but Richard and I will be looking at them at the end of our presentation. If you're participating and uh, watching this webinar in a group, so if you're by yourself, welcome. We're, we'll count you <laughs> as one person. But if you're, there are several of you watching uh, this presentation behind a screen, we'd really love to know how many uh, people are watching. Uh, so if that is you and your colleagues behind the screen, um, then please enter the number of participants in the group. So if there are three of you participating, uh, write three. And so if you click on messaging and then participants, just indicate that there. All right, well, we'll begin our discussion. Um, thank you very much to Boost for having Richard and I today uh, to talk about um, our experience of creating a learning community on reconciliation. Uh, I'm Rachel, the Executive Director of the Child Welfare League. And uh, Richard, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Richard. Uh, I'm an alumni of CARE. Uh, I also sit on the Child Welfare League of Canada Board of Directors and am currently the President of Youth and Care Canada and Provincial Outreach Coordinator of the Saskatchewan Youth and Care and Custody Network. Thanks, Richard. And Richard was a big part of helping create uh, this learning community, so I'm happy to have to be presenting this with you, uh, with him. Um, so today, the plan is to speak about our experience of creating a learning community on reconciliation, our experience of engaging Indigenous youth mentors in that work, um, what happened when we convened that community for the first time face to face, what they learned and what we learned, and what's next uh, for this work. But first, uh, we'll start with uh, talking a little bit about the context. Um, and so we know that there is a vast overrepresentation of uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit youth in care, and that outcomes for those who are in care are um, are not uh, good at all. So that's um, there's a of course a history of colonialism um, and a history of policies and practices that have uh, separated families and created. Um, intergenerational trauma and tremendous harm, uh, harm that was documented uh, by the Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, Commission of Canada, and also the uh, inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, and so there's a context that requires us to take action um, and to change and improve um, uh, the situation so that uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth, can live in dignity and respect. We also know that of the Truth and Reconciliation calls to action, there are 94, uh, 94 of them, only nine have been implemented. Um, so this was the Yellowhead Institute um, who evaluated and measured this. Um, and zero of them, none of them, um, in the area of child welfare have been implemented. So this was really um, our call to, to see what we could do as an organization to change the situation, what was our role? 
and um, so the our own reconciliation path at the Child Welfare League of Canada. Um, if you don't know who the Child Welfare League of Canada is, maybe I should just give you a short <laughs> a short piece on who we are. Um, we are a member-based organization. Uh, we are pan-Canadian and our members range from um, child welfare organizations, providers of uh, housing, uh, working in the area of youth homelessness, youth justice, uh, youth mental health, uh, we also have Indigenous organizations, urban Indigenous organizations, and um, Indigenous communities as um, or community led organizations uh, who are members, and also national organizations um, who, who play a more of an advocacy role. Um, and governments, the departments of children and family services are members of the league. So we're, we're a broad network. And uh, several years ago, we embarked on our own path to reconciliation. Um, so that came with uh, including Indigenous folks on our board of directors as part of our governance, creating an Indigenous child and family committee of the board to help guide our work, um, to help um, yeah, transform our, our practices and inform uh, the, the work of the organization. Um, we, um, just about a year and a half ago, um, asked the uh, First Nations Child and Family Caring Society to host a, uh, a workshop, a Touchstones of Hope workshop. So the Touchstones of Hope is an approach to reconciliation um, that was developed for child welfare, but that is applicable in many other areas. And we'll get a little bit more into detail about what the Touchstones of Hope workshop was. But what it did for our board was really um, help us understand the, um, the the, the role that uh, a national organization and folks in child welfare had to play to foster reconciliation and to think, uh, ask ourselves what we as the Child Welfare League could do, what role could we play? And uh, so we had our um, a workshop on Touchstones of Hope on the history and legacy of child welfare uh, in Canada and its ties to uh, residential schools and the 60s school um, and the ongoing uh, separation and removal of children from their families. Um, but also then think about the dream that we want uh, the future to be for First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, which would be for them to live in dignity um, and uh, and be safe and, and and be respected. And what what does that look like and what is our role to help make that happen? And so out of that workshop, uh, we were able to develop a position paper um, that helped articulate or for others, for the world <laughs> and for ourselves, the relationships that we saw between child welfare and um, colonialism and uh, oppression and, and um, racist practices and the role that we wanted to play um, in, 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 in transforming those relations. Um, and we were asked by the Indigenous Child and Family Committee um, and some of the organizations in our circles, Indigenous led organizations to um, play a role, a leadership role with our peers. And so we gave that some thought, um, the staff gave that some thought, and with the Indigenous Child and Family Committee created uh, a learning community on reconciliation. So I'll get into that more detail, but I want to spend a few minutes talking about um, the touchstones of hope and what they are. So um, there, the, there's a document that explains all the touchstones of hope approach, and it's on the uh, First Nations Child and Family Caring Society website. But essentially there are four principles that we wanted to embrace or that we've committed to embracing going forward, um, which is truth telling, acknowledging, restoring and relating. Um, so truth telling would be to have, like to begin with telling the truth about what happened, to have respectful and open conversations, not easy conversations, but um, important conversations about the foundational ideologies, the policies and the practices of the child welfare system and um, tell the truth about how they have negatively impacted uh, Indigenous children and families and communities. And then acknowledging that this, this is indeed what has happened. Learn from the past and recognize that mainstream child welfare has not worked for Indigenous children and that change is possible if we work together. So truth telling, acknowledging, and then restoring, doing what we can to redress and address the harms that have been done and make sure that that doesn't happen again. And finally, relating, just finding, working together with Indigenous 
uh, folks, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, to be creative, um, to activate and evaluate plans that would create better outcomes for children. So work together to transform um, the, the systems and the ways that we support children and families so that, um, again, we can achieve our dream of Indigenous children living in dignity and respect. So for the Child Welfare League, uh, how we've put that into, into action uh, in leading up to the, um, to the reconciliation learning community was to uh, listen to the truth, not only about the history of child welfare, but also about our relationship with Indigenous organizations. Where had we faltered? What were the, um, what were the areas where we could have acted or uh, where did we uh, do things that might have uh, caused harm? Uh, in our relationships. And then to acknowledge that we had not acted properly in certain circumstances, acknowledge the history, and to say that explicitly. Um, and then to really work on restoring, rebuilding the relationships that we had, um, that we didn't have, or that we had and uh, had that were harmed, um, to, to rebuild and build new trust with organizations, Indigenous organizations and leaders. Um, and then together, once that trust and relationship was uh, established, to together take action um, to uh, change um, things for children and youth. So to setting up this learning community on reconciliation was not something we did on our own. It was a joint effort with the leaders, uh, Indigenous leaders and organizations with whom we had built a relationship. And the um, Indigenous Child and Family Committee was a big, a big part of that. And so we worked um, in partnership. And um, I think, Richard, do you want to talk a little bit about um, about uh, the partnerships that we developed? You, I mean, you were part of, you're part of the Indigenous Child and Family Committee. Um, do you want to just share a little bit about how you were engaged in, uh, in this work? Yes. Um, about a year ago, uh, I was uh, maybe a little less. Uh, I joined the uh, uh, Child Welfare League of Canada as a board of director, and very shortly after that, I was invited to join the Indigenous Child and Family Committee um, as a uh, representative of uh, youth and youth and care voice uh, across Canada. Um, and so, my my role in that was to uh, try to bring the perspectives of the young people that. Uh, I'm privileged to work with uh, both in Saskatchewan and around Canada uh, to make sure that their voice it, was being represented in the creation of this learning community and, and that the message was, was clear uh, for, for the committee and for those that, that joined us in the, in the learning community sessions um, that lived experience of young people is what drives reconciliation. It, it, understanding um, understanding where young people are coming from and bringing that into partnerships and, and the partnerships that were created, uh, partnerships again with uh, uh, Child Welfare League of Canada uh, and numerous uh, agencies um, around Canada, as well as the very important uh, connection and partnership with very strong um, and passionate young people from around Canada. Mm -hmm. And so I'm um, gonna flip back to partnerships for a second, because the partnership with, with yourself, with Youth in Care Canada, with the Assembly of Seven Generations, and with the uh, Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services Society, um, were central to supporting young people to participate. So Indigenous youth were invited um, to join us as mentors to uh, the participating organizations, so the organizations who decided to join the learning community. Um, so let me just spend a few minutes on partnership. So this learning community was developed uh, in partnership with the Indigenous Child and Family Committee um, with uh, an Algonquin traditional teacher, uh, Albert Dumont, who's pictured here with uh, Andrea Auger from the uh, Caring Society, who also played a role in helping shape what this learning community would look like. And so we developed this together. What, what would we look like? Uh, what would it look like? And then how would we uh, support each other to learn and transform our practice? So the goal 
of bringing organizations together in this community was to strengthen their ability to work respectively and creatively with Indigenous people, to reflect on their practice, learn from their peers and from Indigenous youth and elders, and then implement uh, the calls, the tr truth and reconciliation calls to action in their organization. So try things, uh, talk about it and share and, and learn and, and uh, keep trying <laughs> to implement. So that was, um, you know, just that, 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 that those were our, our objectives for the learning community. And so we worked um, with our partners to make that happen. And we also reached out very early on to organizations. We had an open call and then we reached out to all of our members, um, the Child Welfare League members, to see who might be interested in joining the community and ask them, what are some of the things you're struggling with? What do you need? Uh, we had heard anecdotally that many uh, had reconciliation as part of their uh, plans for their or uh, on their strategic plans or was something that they were engaged in, but really um, needed support to get things to the the practice point. So um, uh, moving from from strategy to concrete action. And so the community was there to help with that. And uh, youth mentors were an important part of that work. And this is a quote here um, from youth mentors after they had participated in the fall face-to-face uh, -face meeting of the community that they really enjoyed. So I really enjoyed being a youth mentor. I was able to express some of my opinions and thoughts that were being carefully listened to by these organizations. And the level of respect organizations gave to us was phenomenal. Um, so I'll just talk about that face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. Um, is there more you wanted to say, actually, um, about the role of youth, uh, uh, Richard, about, yeah, maybe you could just talk a little bit about the role of youth in that face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. Um, so let me just frame it for one second. We met, the 33 organizations met, uh, we divided them into two groups uh, last fall, and our goal for that meeting was to help them create a common vision for our learning community, but like the work that we wanted to do together. Mm -hmm. And then we each organization developed their own reconciliation action plans that were specific to them. And that involved um, looking at changes they could make in governance and programs and policy uh, in the relationships that they had with organizations and community. So maybe Richard, you could share a little bit about the role that youth played in those few days in the fall. Yeah, um, I, I guess to start with, uh, um, it was uh, um, Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services uh, and Assembly of Seven Generations and Youth and Care Canada um, that brought young people, um, youth mentors uh, to the table. And, and it was through the support of the Child Welfare League of Canada um, and uh, their policy analyst, uh, Jake, who, uh, who I had the pleasure of working with uh, in engaging with, with, with these uh, strong young people and we worked with them in the beginning just to kind of explain to them what, you know, what the process was going to be, what the purpose of this was, and what their purpose was. And, and so we did that, we, we did that uh, um, virtually first, and then, and, then we, uh, um, and then when we met in person, um, we spent uh, the week um, talking with them um, throughout the entire um, session, making sure that they were um, that they were comfortable in their role, and their role uh, was very simply to lead the conversation by sharing their experiences and sharing their expectations. And so um, these wonderful young people um, stood up and shared with a group of child welfare professionals uh, what their experiences living in child welfare has been and what their expectations were, what reconciliation meant to them and means to them, and really what, what they wanted to walk away with, what they wanted the, the agencies to walk away with in building a plan to make sure that young people now and in the future are represented appropriately and are being provided with 
the um, care, resources, and services that they require. Uh, so the engagement process um, was very empowering uh, for me to, to watch these young people really stand up and throughout the sessions um, with confidence um, tell the child welfare professionals what needed to happen at the end of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and they, so there were six uh, youth and uh, they were accompanied by, so Richard was there to support youth, um, Gabby from Gabrielle Fayant from the Assembly of Seven Generations was there, was there to support youth and Jessica from the Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services was there as well. So the youth who came weren't on their own. Um, they were uh, accompanied by people in whom they had trust uh, and they were able to connect to before, uh, during the session, but also afterwards. So that was very important. And um, while youth did share their stories, we, we invited them to be experts and mentors. And so sharing their story was up to them um, if they used it as a, as a teaching tool. Um, but they weren't there, um, they, weren't, they weren't there, we didn't ask them to just share their stories for us to learn. In fact, we asked them to coach us and guide us. And that was just their own, their own way of doing that, was to integrate their personal lived experience. And it was very powerful. Um, so I think it's helpful to know that um, at that first meeting, there were like 33 organizations, 58 people who were part of the organizations um, that had signed up for this. So these, you know, 58 uh, people and organizations, they, um, they were surrounded by um, or accompanied by youth mentors, by the elder, Elder Dumont, folks from the Caring Society were there and um, leaders of uh, Indigenous organizations uh, in Indigenous communities and in urban uh, settings also who are members of our committee um, who were there as well. So they were supported by uh, in, in a circle with, uh, with uh, uh, several of us, all of us together supporting each other's learning. Um, and those organizations who had signed up had um, brought for their, uh, their CEO their executive directors. So there were there was each organization dedicated two people to this process, um, with few exceptions. And those two people were often a senior leader or the executive director and a person who would help with implementation. So what we thought was that in order for change to happen, we need decision-making power at the table and we need um, people who can help implement that plan uh, on the ground, so program director or partner from the community or indigenous leader from within the organization who could help uh, activate the the plan going out of the community. Um, so the the face to face convening always like for the two days. So we did two two day events, and uh, it started with opening circle with the elder, and then the youth had a chance to speak, um, and then we had uh, breakouts into small groups with the youth. Uh, two by two, were able to share right from the first day their um their idea of what reconciliation meant and what they were expecting so they set the tone as richard was saying for organizations like here's the change we need to see you know we, uh, that we're challenging you to um in these few days uh, the work that we want to see you do um, and every time we had a closing circle um same we, there was always space for young voices to to be heard um and we had the, the Caring Society facilitate a Touchstones of Hope workshop for the learning community um, to allow us to think through what our role was uh, together. And then some time on the second day for the organizations to work individually on their own organizational plans, put down what they, the work they had already done, but also put down concrete, actionable, uh, items in each of those sections that I mentioned earlier. So governance, uh, funding, um, program policies, and relationship building. Then they what they had time with um, with uh, Indigenous leaders from organizations on, who sit on our committee and youth mentors to read and share their plans and get feedback on them. And so the youth were able to say, you know, to challenge organizations and 
uh, here's, you know, you can, we think you can go farther on this, or have you given some thought to this or that, and that there was um, great value for, for, uh, for, for people who were in attendance. So some of the outcomes, for instance, well, the comments, you know, the action plan allowed me to gain a better understanding of what's needed for reconciliation, and the feedback from youth mentors allowed me to reflect on my practice. Um, so there were that. So everyone left that. Um, everyone left the learning community uh, with some uh, concrete plans, um, at least a draft. Uh, many um, wrapped that up very quickly and were able to send it back to us so that we could share it with everyone. Others took time uh, to to develop their plan, get buy-in within their organizations, uh, develop like. Uh, really detailed timelines, have it approved by their board. So there's uh, each organization uh, went about it in a different way, but they all, uh, except for a few, a few who, who could not uh, share their plans, but um, most uh, sent their plans back and we've posted them on a private site for everyone to look at each other's plans and uh, fulfill our commitment to support each other in implementation. So the outcomes, while we have like, you know, it's the essentially the outcomes of pulling, bringing people together, learning together. Um, the work is still to come. Like we're not, we're not done here. We're just beginning. <laughs> um, so what we learned, like it, we did a, a short evaluation post event, and we learned that uh, participants um, felt that, that the meeting and that that for face to face gathering had strengthened their ability to work creatively, respectfully, and collaboratively with Indigenous folks. Um, many had not seen that kind of uh, collaboration in action, and most, I would say, had not been in a circle with Indigenous youth to hear directly from them about the kinds of uh, things they wanted to see from the organizations that served them. Um, uh, Participants said that it had allowed them to reflect on their practice and learn from their peers and experts. And here again, youth mentors were a highlight. And um, organizations had a, a plan in concrete actions that they could take action towards reconciliation. So um, those were the things that people learned. And there's 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 more, I'm sure, if, uh, if we interviewed every one of them about what they uh, took away from that, but um, maybe we could take some time, Richard, to see like it was learning on our side as well. It wasn't just uh, the learning was was mutual. Um, so, did you want to share a little bit about some of what you learned in taking part in this, uh, Richard? You were there for the whole four days, like with two different cohorts. Yeah, yeah, being able to be there for 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 both sessions uh, and working with uh, with uh, both groups and, and working with young people throughout um allowed me to really uh to really engage and to really reflect on uh, on my understanding of of reconciliation um one of the one of the things that I, that I took away from that um growing up in an urban setting uh and living most of my life in an urban setting i didn't I didn't take into account the importance of spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health connected to the land, to making sure that um, all of us um, are connected to the land and to nature and to understanding the importance of embracing, embracing, um, embracing that. Uh, and so I, I really took that away and, and have used that in my life since then, um, in my in my tiny yard. Um, and uh, and the reaffirmation that that uh, child welfare professionals do this because they care. You know, they, they do this because they care. They bring their heart into their work. Oftentimes working with young people in, in the capacity that I that I uh, have, have been able to do, um, it's easy to get lost behind the policy. And it's, it, what I learned here was that, was that behind the policy that is sometimes overwhelming, sometimes negative, um, in its reception, 
there are caring people. And that's what I saw throughout the entire week uh, at these learning sessions, uh, le learning communities, was, was all of these child welfare professionals engaging one-on-one -on -one and as a group with young people, encouraging them, empowering them, and learning from them. Um, so so the, those are my takeaways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, it was interesting to hear um, like Elder Dumont uh, really bringing his um, teachings from nature in every contribution that he made. And then hearing youth who had grown up, Indigenous youth who had grown up in urban settings to to hear from them about the importance of going back to to the land or having time with elders on the land so i agree that was quite moving and uh and for me i think also as um my background is in like popular education and social movement learning so you know that kind of trans transformative learning um and the, the power to ch to create change uh by uh, through that learning so what um i think what for me, that this whole experience um, really brought to light the the importance of and the value of working together with many people and the, all the investment that we made that the Child Welfare League and that uh, made in building relationships with Indigenous leaders and also with them for them to commit to our organization to want to see it uh, to believe to see it succeed to see it do its part for reconciliation. Like I have tremendous. Uh, respect for um, several, well, for all of our board members, but a few of our board members who really uh, put all their heart into this work to help transform um, the Child Welfare League and our relationship with Indigenous um, organizations and, um, and leaders. So uh, it was great to be able to see the, that to fruition in a sense, like we were all working together um, to make a meaningful contribution to help the, the, us play a leadership role with our peers. Um, so um, for me, that was, um, I guess the learning was just the, the power of that and the, how, how worthwhile it is to invest in those, in those relationships because um, we can create real change through that. Um, so of course the learning is not done, as I mentioned, this is, the work of getting together and talking about what needs to be done is not the same thing as getting the work done. And uh, talking about reconciliation is important and the truth telling and acknowledging is important, but we really do have to get to that transformation, the restoring um, and relating in different ways. And so the learning community um, is now shifting its focus to online, which was always the plan for now. <laughs> it was, um, we had three working groups scheduled for uh, the coming year. So we met in the fall. We had one working group meeting in February, and we had another working group meeting just a few weeks ago. So the first one was online, and we created kind of an online circle um, and uh, had um, Ken Richard, who sits on our board of directors um, and who's a member of the committee, um, also, he's uh, the founder of the uh, Native Child and Family Services in Toronto. He did a presentation on wise practices in Indigenous child welfare. And we listened together afterwards to updates from the group, from members of the learning community, some of the challenges they were facing, some of the things, the questions they had. And they were able to hear from Ken and from other leaders who were on the call, um, feedback and guidance and coaching. Um, so that was valuable. We heard from members afterwards that they wanted more time to, to do that and hear more from other organizations. So we met when, when we met a, a few weeks ago, um, it was the focus of the working group was to hear from members about the work that they were doing and with space for questions and challenging each other. Of course, this meeting was, uh, and very influenced and shaped by the current context. Um, and so the COVID has led to, as I'm sure you are all familiar, um, has led to um, family separation, um, uh, limited visitation between children and their families. Um, and this has been very difficult for, for everyone, but um, especially for indigenous folks who are also dealing with um, 
the trauma of uh, historical trauma of disease, family separation. So this is very, um, it's a traumatic experience for everyone, but especially for Indigenous folks. Um, and so we uh, had spent a lot of time talking about um, the family separation, ways in which we can maintain connection, connection to family, culture, community. Um, uh, Albert Dumont was on that was on that call and was able to help uh, guide the process. There uh, was a young woman from uh, the Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Society and also learning community members to help again guide. So as members were raising questions about like, how do I maintain connections in this difficult time? Or like, how do I build relationships with indigenous organizations and talking about the struggles, they were able to get uh, concrete uh, feedback and tips. Um, and we're, we're, we were all reminded that uh, building relationships is a first step and acknowledging and truth telling is our first steps, but that the hard work <laughs> is yet to to be done which is the transforming the, the power structures that are maintaining these inequalities and um so given the current situation the we were meant to meet again in the fall like so just take a little breathing space um, for the summer um but uh, given the situation and the importance um uh, of maintaining family connections um we're meeting and the, the trauma that's happening right now we decided to meet um, again, in a few weeks, to talk about reconciliation efforts in the context of a of a crisis. So, no doubt about uh, about it that the child welfare situation was already in crisis mode uh, for Indigenous folks in Canada. But uh, um, now, it's, it's very it, there. There's a increased need to talk about the and put into practice uh, some of the the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in terms of fostering those connections, family reunification. Um, so uh, yes, there's a lot of work for us to for us to do, and the uh, learning community is a great vehicle for people to to have to um, to do that in. Did, um, Richard, you ha you were part of those well, one of those meetings, anyways. Were you? Do you have any thoughts or? On the working groups or anything you wanted to add i think just like the learning community sessions that we had in person uh the the working groups um you know are are equally as powerful and 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 as engaging uh people are able to you know talk about what's happening right now in their communities in their agencies um and can bounce ideas and, and 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 give suggestions to to others, and I think that is really what a learning community is about. I really believe that that's what collaboration is about. Um, and I'm seeing oftentimes when you have an have an event like this, everybody goes back to their perspective corners, and um, although they strive to to meet. Um, the expectations of that event, oftentimes it gets it gets bogged down with with day to day work. What I'm seeing with these working groups is that that's not happening. That people are staying engaged. That they are staying focused to their plans that they, that they started to create at the learning communities, and that they are still being respectful uh, of what the young people brought to those sessions. And making sure that they're that, that that they are doing their best within their agencies uh, to provide those services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they 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 have made some concrete steps. Some of them have uh, implemented uh, a training on touchstones of hope for all new staff. Others have created an advisory council of um, of indigenous leaders from their community. Uh, so there have been some concrete steps. Every time I hear from from uh, learning community members, they, they always come, I mean, they have some dilemmas, like what do we do with this or how can we do you know, this or that in, the, in a good way? Um, but they've made concrete moves towards implementing their plan, even in difficult uh, circumstances. And they were very interested in, and concerned about the situation now and how they can play a role um, in uh, maintaining those those relations with family and community and culture. It's it's um 
it's it's kind of I don't want to be tacky, but it's inspiring. <laughs> it's inspiring um, and motivating to know that there are committed people, that they have plans, and that they, those meetings, the working group meetings, are very well attended. Uh, over 80% of the of the community members attend those calls. So for me, that's an indication of the of the commitment. So that's um, I'm excited about that. Um, so the next steps are uh, for this learning community are to want to add uh, new members in the fall. Just uh, we'll put out a call out this fall, maybe expand it a little bit, maybe add like you know five or so members, maybe ten. Uh, not too much, but uh, there's I think there's room for others. We want to uh, we'll continue virtual gatherings, um, but ideally uh, you know once a year we would meet face to face. Uh, and we had planned next spring, not this spring, next spring, if it's safe to do um, on the land uh, activities and to create um, an opportunity for youth mentors to come together one or two days before the learning community so that they can have time to um, to do their own thing, to, you know, to strengthen their themselves and their work. Um, we're also exploring um, mentoring and learning exchanges online. Like we recognize that uh, that people need that additional support, especially in a in a context where they're dealing with uh, an urgent situation. How do you make sure that the touchstones of hope uh, principles are front and center in all you do? Um, so that uh, we'll be looking for online opportunities for people to support each other with that. Um, so I, I have a few resources I just wanted to share. I think on the uh, Child Welfare League of Canada website, so cwlc.ca, uh, there's a guidance note that was developed with Youth and Care Networks, Rob Richard, uh, and Youth and Care Canada included, um, on maintaining connections for children and youth during COVID-19. And so it's a uh, just a call for all of us to be creative and to do everything we can to preserve those relationships. Even if people can't see each other face to face, like, you know, are there, are there exceptions in which case, in what cases, you know, how can we do that safely respecting public health? Uh, but also how can we maintain those connections to family culture and community um, in alternative ways? Um, so I know that uh, along those lines, Native Child and Family Services uh, in Toronto has been facilitating online cultural events and um, prayer circles. And so the, there's, there's examples. And also um, wanted to share some resources from the First Nations uh, Child and Family Caring Society. They've put together um, Spirit Bears uh, COVID-19 resources. Uh, so activities uh, for children, um, there's the Spirit Bear plan, it's there, which is a, a plan for uh, equity and uh, justice for First Nations children. So you can look at what those those uh, steps are to what, um, uh, yes, <laughs> have a look at the Spirit Bear plan. Um, and also uh, documents um, related to Touchstones of Hope, which I we got into um, describing today, but there are work uh, tools and uh, a range of very great resources, many of them geared to children. So that's also uh, uh, where you can find kind of follow up information. And what I'll do is maybe before we um, we move on to questions, I just wanted to share. Um, so this is um, salmon bear, and I know that uh, Richard, do you have your bear there as well? Yeah, he's kind of bears in the background here. Pardon me as I stand up. Uh, <laughs> So these are these are bears that were uh, gifted to our organizations um, by the Caring Society. They have a program um, called the Embarrister Program, and um, so this is kind of our. So we we adopted um, Salmon Bear here, and um, and we bring him to events. Uh, we bring him to our learning. Um, well, the learning community was there as well. Um, our board uh, meetings, and he's. Um, a reminder um, of uh, the 165,000 children who were uh, First Nations children who were unnecessarily removed from their families because of um, underfunding and discriminatory uh, child and family services uh, service funding um, 
So the the um, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found the government guilty of having uh, discriminated against First Nations children by underfunding child and family services. Um, and so the Embarrister uh, program is just a reconciliation initiative to help uh, keep those children in our hearts as a motivating uh, for our work um, and to show solidarity and um, yeah. And so Spirit Bear is, is, has a whole big family. So what do you do with your uh, bear, Richard? Using care, using care bear um, again was was gifted to us by uh, by the First Nation Child and Family Caring Society, um, and uh, and and in using care bear um, has the Jordan's principle um, insignia on 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 bear's belly, um, which I think is very important. Um, so as uh, um, as the current president of Youth and Care Canada, um, I was uh, given I was given the bear to take to take back with me to Saskatchewan. And uh, prior to COVID, uh, Bear and I traveled around to various uh, events and uh, presentations, uh, meeting with young people and meeting with uh, um, child welfare professionals. And and bear would bear bear would sit with me as I made presentations, and, and make sure that um, the spirit of of reconciliation was present in 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 all of the conversations that we have. Within COVID nineteen, bear once in a while makes an appearance um, on Instagram and Twitter, um, trying to spread. Uh, an important message of, of, of hope and strength um, and that this too shall pass and making sure that the negative messages are overridden by the positive messages right now for young people. Uh, and so, um, and Bear and I are very excited once COVID has passed to get back on the road and, and keep sp uh, spreading that message of hope. So if you can find out more about the, um embarrassed or program on the Caring Society website. Many people, so you have to make your own commitment to naming your bear, to, to learning about reconciliation and the um, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal um, case. Um, so I, I, it's, been, it's been nice for us. And every time I bring um, Salmon Bear, he was named by children at an event with the Caring Society. Um, I'm amazed at how even older youth <laughs> really gravitate towards the bear. Um, so I think it's a sign, it's just a symbol for them that we we're thinking of them, we care about them. Um, so I've seen I've seen the bear in action. It's um it's a little weird to walk around with a bear at first, but you get used to it really quickly when you see the impact it has. <laughs> Enough about bears. Um, I would like to I think transition to questions uh, now from your questions. We have you know, about uh, 10 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna leave this um, how can I do this? I forget. Just one second here. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and move on to your questions. Uh, all right, there are several questions here. I'm not seeing them. Oh, uh, one second here. Okay, the website, please. That's the question. There's a website. <laughs> I'm not sure which website. Um, you were asking about so um i can say that the if you google caring society you'll get to the uh the website with all of the resources about the caring society if you okay you got it thanks angie <laughs> um so will anyone have um any questions about the uh the learning community our work or your own work on reconciliation Richard, do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I have any questions. Uh, but for those of you um, listening, um, I will. I will just say that that if you are, um, you know, if you are working on building reconciliation plans, or if you are uh, working directly with with youth in and from care, um, 
and you would like to learn more about uh, about how to do that, uh, the Child Welfare League of Canada is a great place to uh, is a great resource. The uh, uh, First Nations Child and Family Caring Society uh, and the other agencies that we mentioned here, as well as Youth and Care Canada, um, we can provide a lot of resources. Um, so if you have a local network in your area uh, or you want to create one, uh, please feel free to contact either, you know, Rachel or myself. Um, and, 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 you know, we can, we can help you with that um, in, in making sure that, that young people are engaged um, and that they are feeling uh, safe, protected and respected in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure working with you on this, um, Richard, such valuable experience. And you're always bringing and recommending fantastic young leaders to our to our tables. And I know that you care about them deeply and that that um, and that you're supporting them. Um, so that means a, a lot um, to know that that youth are well supported and cared for and engaged. Well, thank you for that. And there don't seem don't appear to be any questions. So I think um, I think we might close this uh, webinar um, with a huge thanks again to Boost for, for allowing us to share uh, our excitement for the learning community um, and the work that we've been doing here with the Caring Society, with uh, folks on our Indigenous Child and Family Committee, Elder Dumont, all the young leaders. Um, really great, uh, great work. Um, there seems to be maybe a question. No. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, everybody who tuned in. Um, and take good care. And uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, um, have, have a wonderful week and stay safe. And from, uh, from myself and from Bear, um, have a wonderful day. <laughs>